everybody. Thanks. Um, it looks like um, a lot of familiar faces here tonight, and thanks for coming out to our forum on the use of town properties. Um, my name is Rob Scher. I'm the current chair of the Board of Selectmen, and I'm here to just introduce things uh, briefly. Um, to my left is Yolanda Greaves. She's here, and Yolanda may be um, uh, doing some updates. People may be live streaming, and so we may hear, hopefully we'll hear from them during the night. And of course, Michael Herbert, our town manager, will be doing the bulk of the presentation tonight. And Joe Magnani, our other selectman, is up front. Um, so anyway, welcome. And hopefully we'll get you out of here fairly quickly. Uh, Michael's prepared a presentation. This is a public forum on the use of town properties. And just to quickly reprise, we're going to be talking tonight about the Valentine property, Hall House, which is 433 Chestnut Street, um, the Warren Conference Center barn, Girl Scout property. Who remembers the name? Camp? Oh, my gosh. Okay, very good. In the Simpson Western Nursery properties and 22 Elliott Street, which is the uh, house there on the... Uh, so, again, welcome. Um, and without further ado... Uh, oh, and I uh, would just ask, we have a microphone over here. And I think as Michael goes through the properties at each one, he's going to stop for questions and feedback. Is that how you plan to do it? And... So just come up to the microphone, uh, just introduce yourself, and, um, and remember, oh, Carl Hackinson's here, another uh, select, uh, select board member. Welcome, Carl. All right, so without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Michael, and um, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so again, my name is Michael Herbert. I'm the uh, town manager here. And, uh, you know, as many of you know that have been paying attention, um, uh, first of all, it's great to see such a good number of people here, and actually some new faces. I think um, I think that's really nice to see. That's always nice to see when we're having a, a discussion, a community-wide discussion like this. Um, but again, as uh, Rob said, this is our forum on publicly or town-owned properties. Um, those of you that have um, been paying attention to town government know that we've acquired a number of properties over the last couple of years. Um, and that's been strategic, um, but then we're going to talk about some of those properties, but then we're also going to talk about some of the properties that we've had for a while. And uh, while this is not a comprehensive inventory of all the properties we have, these are the ones that, we, that generate pretty much the most interest or the most discussion. I think that's fair to say. Um, I will say, just preface it by saying that, you know, some people ask, you know, why do you buy properties when you don't necessarily have a plan? And plan for those. And I think that's a totally legitimate question. And the answer is that we don't necessarily have the opportunity to formulate a plan when a property comes on the market or we get wind of a seller being willing to dispose of the property. Um, unfortunately, we have to act quickly um, with before sometimes that we can have a plan developed. And so, um, but the thing is, is if we wait, we then lose the opportunity to have control of that property and then decide what we want to do. So that's uh, one of the reasons why we um, have chosen to act on some of these. Um, in terms of the format, we've got six properties that we're going to discuss tonight. Uh, I think we'll try to limit it to 15 minutes each. Um, I believe Yolanda is going to be keeping time so we can uh, make sure that we end this promptly at 9 o'clock. Um, we're not trying to make a definitive decision tonight on these properties. Um, what we're looking for is, is getting some ideas, um, putting out some ideas that might be an amalgamation of some of the ideas that we've heard from you or from other people. Uh, some of them might be new. Um, and um, so the way we'll do it in terms of, of a format is we'll go through each property. Um, I'll, start to, I'll start it by discussing some of the restrictions that we have on the property some of the strengths and weaknesses related to each of the properties, and then some potential suggested uses, and we can use that as a way to start the discussion. So um, that being said, we will start off with our first property today, um, tonight. Um, we're going to discuss the Valentine property um, on 133 West Union Street. It's our most recent acquisition, um, nice historic house uh, that was built that in the barn in the, um, in the 17 and 1800s. Um, we bought this using a combination of a debt exclusion and um, CPA funds. So the restrictions that we have related to this property is uh, we have to maintain the historical character of it. Uh, we can't do housing. It was, a, it was bought with um, recreation CPA funds and um, 
historical CPA funds. Looking at Beth, do we have anything else? I don't remember exactly. Was it, was it some open space as well? Okay, sorry. Um, I think some of the strengths of it, uh, you know, it has a very prominent location on 133, so it's very, very visible. Um, it's got seven acres, which is a decent size, um, decent size lot. Uh, the structures are, are fairly big, including the barn. It also has a number of historic elements. It's, uh, you know, one of the a few remaining types of architecture like this in, uh, in the Ashland area. I think some of the weaknesses related to this uh, property is the cost to rehabilitate the buildings uh, will be significant. Um, you know, I, I don't think anybody would dispute that. Uh, and I'm talking about both the house and, um, and the barn as well. Um, and then it also has a significant number of wetlands on the property. And, um, you know, wetlands are certainly, they don't prohibit, necessarily prohibit things, but they, um, you know, you have to work around them, you have to mitigate them, you have to uh, make sure that the standards of the Wetland, uh, Wetlands Protection Act are, um, are maintained. Some of the potential uses we've talked about. Um, everybody knows the Holliston Historical Society and some of the uses that, that it presents. Uh, we could certainly look at doing something like that with this. Um, another uh, thing that has been brought up is a performing, like a performing arts center. Um, I think Carl Hackinson, you know, right after we, um, right after we purchased the property, uh, sent me a link to um, what's it's called uh, Vinegar Hill in Arundel, Maine. And uh, it is a uniquely restored barn that is used as a performing arts center. It is tremendous. It also has a farmhouse on the property as well. Uh, we could certainly look at doing something like that as well. Obviously, that would take um, quite a bit of money to, uh, to do um, and, and restore. Um, with seven acres, we could potentially bring it back to being a, a workable farm or community gardens. Um, could potentially have a restaurant. Uh, we have a, a number of vendors at the farmer's market who are within the Metro West area. Perhaps this is something that they could utilize to expand their portfolio of farmable land. Um, and we could always work out things like partnerships with, you know, some of our restaurants sourcing food uh, from that farm or community garden um, and things of that nature. So any of the board members or audience have different thoughts or thoughts about that? Um, we need you to come to the microphone. Sorry. Well, I can actually repeat the question, too. So um, Ed Brutz uh, has asked, could we put a greenhouse on the property? I believe we can put a greenhouse on the property. There was a greenhouse on the property. There's still the footprint of the property. Yes, Robin. Do you, you don't have any interest in this property, right? Not at all. Okay. Uh, Robin Hicks, 11 Franklin Road. Uh, this, it used to be a farm, uh, a four-man farm in, in, during the war. People came in from Boston, grew their own food. Um, so it has very fertile land. Uh, I, I think we should really look at that. Um, grow, like you said, a farmer's market or have the uh, community garden there. I brought some plans. So if anyone wants to dabble, put some ideas on them, they're welcome to. Um, and they're just small versions. That's what the property looks like. I don't know if Joey can hold that up. That's the house. That's the barn. This was all field at one time. This is now a stream, and it used to be underground. There are tiles still that control this stream and points. But it's very, very fertile land. I mean, you put a shovel in there, you've got 24 inches of topsoil. So, excellent. Um, yeah, any other thoughts? Hey, Julie. Hi, my name is Julie. Um, I, if, if we're, is it going to be self-sustaining? Are you going down that road? Say you're going down that road. Um, one idea is to, you know, kind of like the Rose Center, where you have really neat programs 
the, I, I'm a small business owner, and there's almost nowhere to have really cool programs in a setting like that. So if that could be one of the uses, I think multi-uses would be awesome, but just one for programs. Yeah, I think those familiar with like the Hopkinton Center for the Arts, they use that as not just an art house, but they use it to run classes, I think, like Julie's talking about. Kate, sorry. Hi. My name's Kate Jerzyk. Um, I don't have a specific idea, but I just do want to reiterate um, what other people said. I think we have to make it self-sustaining because anybody who has a house, just a regular house, knows the cost of that and added to this. And... I also think we've heard a lot of talk, I think going back when Carl first presented, I think we should try to think multi-use because that sort of makes sense. And I would love to see part of it a farm because I think that's our roots and I think that property warrants it. But I, I'm not sure, I know like Concord has, they value farmland, mm -hmm. so they, they give very, I mean, very low cost leases, maybe even a dollar to, to farm. So I think, Getting money from the farming part is probably difficult. We have to say we value that, but I still think there's a way to make that all work. And I, I hope I, I don't think your intent was to make even decisions. Today. I think this is a bigger process, but I think we just need to work harder at getting more ideas and more people involved to make decisions. And I think, I mean, perhaps there's ways also like if we would turn it over to an agency, but they're sort of running it right, that there's groups that do that, that they're gonna make some money out of it, but that also keeps the maintenance going. And then we still have space available for people. How are we doing on time, Yolanda? You're Roughly, good. okay. I really like the- Hi, Preston. Uh, oh, I'm Preston Crow. Um, I really like the idea of the Performing Arts Center, um, but I'd also like to think about other properties that could have something like that. I'm thinking the old fire station downtown might be a good option for that as well. Um, but I think that's something that we should have a priority in town of getting something like that somewhere. I mean, I, th I think that's a, a good point. I think when we're talking about things, like you can, a community and actually a region can only handle so many performing arts centers, right? So. You know, if we're going to look at doing something like that, should we look at putting it in a place where we want to activate more, like a downtown, something like that? I think that's a good question. And, and I think um, Kate brings up some good points. I mean, there are partnerships that we can realize that would make this self-sustaining. And I think what you're talking about, Kate, is, you know, in a way the town subsidizing. Like, so we've purchased the property. Um, we could lease it at low or no cost to... Um, an organization or an agency, I believe, through an RFP process, and maybe they don't pay us, you know, a flat rate. Maybe they pay us a portion or, or something like that. So we would, but they wouldn't have the land costs associated with it. So uh, we would, in turn, be subsidizing that. Um, what do people think about? We've talked about multi-purpose. Um, what would people think about, like a combination of a perform, like a, a performing arts or a historical center, like the Holliston Historical Society? with the barn and you've got some area for the parking in the back. Um, and then what if we use, like if you're looking at the house on the right, you use that for farming and some community gardens and then you make the restaurant or the farmhouse maybe like a farm to table restaurant or a place to process some of that. Do you, would people be interested in, in something like that? Um, what about the subsidizing of an organization to do that. Just by a show of hands, how many people would be interested in that? Okay. So, well, like, like I said, you know, if, so we've bought the property for three and a half million, and let's say we want to do a farm to table restaurant, and we find a restaurateur who wants to do that, or, or a group of farmers, and we give it, we let them use the land at no cost. You know, we would essentially be subsidizing them because they wouldn't have to pay the money. So obviously a lot of details would have to be worked out, but as long as people are, you know, not like, heck no, you know, to the idea. It's risky. It is, it is risky. I think, I think anything we do is going to be risky because this is going to be groundbreaking type of stuff for Ashland. I think we've got to be aware of that. But Risky for who? Yep, no, 
understood. No, I'm just, the, there's a lot of risk in running a restaurant. Yeah. And the um, success rates, I, I apologize, I don't know the percentages, but I don't believe they're that high. So I feel that that is one of the riskier versus it's a model that is, could potentially have more turnover than we might be looking at versus something like the rentable historical center. Um, you can potentially be booking that out further in advance. The sustainability feels a little less risky in that. I, I would just like to add to that, and, and, and I have to agree with you on that. When this first discussion started uh, about a year ago, and Kyle said there was a potential that this property may be available, the first thing that came to my mind is that I had just passed the Holliston uh, Historical Society, and that place is always busy, always busy. And we talked about making it self-sustaining. That definitely is self-sustaining. And, you know, you, it probably helped bring some money back into the town instead of you folks taking it out of, well, all of us taking it out of our pockets to pay for things that, you know, we're, we're paying a lot for now. So this should, to me, I think it's a, it, I would like to see that, to go that, and in, in heading towards that direction. Um, the house itself, um, I know that we're always looking for more office space for administrative uh, offices. Uh, right now, one of our schools is housing all their administrative uh, offices in a school and using classrooms. You're taking up classroom space for offices. So my suggestion would be to use the house and redo the house for office space for the school administrators and you take them out of the schools and now you have classroom space that is now made available. Just a thought, just a thought. So, so to get, get, get a brainstorm going, because this is going to go, this yeah, right. is not going to happen overnight. Right. Overnight. So Robin asked if, if we could form committees for properties, and certainly the Board of Selectmen could form working groups, like we've had ad hoc committees or working groups for different properties. I think something like this would definitely lend itself to that. But I think hearing some themes here, like self-sustaining, diversification, um, you know, so if you have a number of uses for the property, if one doesn't necessarily work, maybe the other can, can kind of pick up the right. slack, seems good. So just, um, as I've been seeing this, not only the Valentine property, but we have some other great properties that we've purchased and we're moving forward on things. I think about Warren Woods, and we purchased Warren Woods, and there is a group that oversees what's going on at Warren Woods. Um, so I, th I personally see similar things for something like the Valentine Estate, where it's not going to all be public money, you know, it's not going to be all our tax dollars that's going to be able to create what we see happening there. We're going to have to do private-public partnerships, um, and we're going to have to do fundraising. And I think, as you said, Robin, there are people here who are, they're focused on the Valentine Estate, and that's where they want to put their energies. And I think just like anything else here in town, people put their energy where their passion is. And we can support that, and those people can then work with the board and town management and the citizens to bring forward what we think is necessary or what the community sees for each piece of property. Forty Lake View. Mike, is there um, how many square feet is the main building? I want to say twenty three hundred. Is it structurally with it? Um, structurally, I think both the barn and the house are in good shape. So the house is the older house, and then it has an addition on the back. Um, I don't think we found any. Um, and David, where's Foster? He's here somewhere. Oh, of course. So. Um, I don't think there are any structural issues. I think the structure's in good shape. I think most of it's cosmetic and, you know, the envelope. Right. How big's the barn? Big. If you could put an addition on in the back for, for bathrooms or things of that nature, if you could go to a, um, a theater and or uh, recreational facility like the Holliston Society has, they added on to the back, they added on the kitchen, they added on the bathroom, right. so you could have fun things there. 
No. Nope. But the main structure itself is the, uh, the functional area itself. Now, can people get in and see this? Get inside? Good question. With permission, yeah. Through you? Yes. Okay. Okay. Awesome. 40, so Carl said the barn is 40 by 60. I think you're right, actually. No. Um, all right. There used to be an addition on the barn uh, for a garage, and they, they tore it off. There, so, and there's, there's a footprint there that, that, that you can put in. That's the concrete, concrete base on the back. So, a lot of potential for that barn. It's a lot. Um, it's got the old chestnut beams. Oh, yeah, it's beautiful. Um, all right, I think we got some good thoughts uh, related to this. I think probably the best thing to do would be to form a committee afterwards to start looking and exploring this. Um, next property we're going to talk about is 40, uh, I can talk, yes, uh, 433 Chestnut Street, um, what we call the Hall House. Uh, this property and the next property we're going to talk about, which is the Warren Barn, were actually uh, purchased as part of the transaction of the Warren Conference Center um, by Framingham State from Northeastern. Um, and so the town, to make the deal work uh, collectively and to keep um, the Warren Conference Center out of developers' hands, um, the town needed to play a role in the, in the, in the transaction. And so we purchased uh, this property and the barn um, for I believe it was about $290,000. And so this property it was occupied, I think, as recently as five years ago. But it's, um, it's certainly, um, certainly seen better days. Um, it, uh, right now, we have no restrictions on the property, you know, at least in terms from a legal or statutory standpoint. Um, from a strengths um, perspective, I, I think it's a good size house. Um, it's got some historic elements, which I will get back to a little bit, a little bit later or get to a little later. Um, weaknesses, it has, um, it, it's going to be really, really expensive to renovate um, and rehabilitate. And then also, it has an awkward lot. So when the Board of Selectmen were deciding the property to purchase, they wanted to make sure that they protected as much of the property around it as possible. So you kind of have an elongated lot where you have a small um, envelope around the, the house itself, but then it has a lot of frontage along Chestnut Street. Um, so that was to curtail any kind of potential development if Framingham State decided to sell the property, their property in the, um, in the future. Um, potential uses, um, you know, as Joe said, we always need office space, uh, something that is at a premium or storage space. Um, this property is special in actually the Warren Barn and actually the Valentine property is special in that it is, um, this is one of 11 properties um, I believe that were identified by a consultant in, I think it was 2010, Julie, when the, when the Historical Commission uh, commissioned a, um, an expert to look at properties that would be eligible for the historic register, and this was one of them. Um, and so I think, you know, if, if history is something that's important to us and something that we want to maintain and, and um, you know, something that we value, some of these properties that are eligible or could be eligible for the historic register are, are things that we should look at restoring to those historic standards and actually getting them on the historic register. Um, so again, this is going to be a very, very expensive proposition because just restoring a property in general is, takes a lot of money, but restoring it to historic standards can take uh, more too. Um, but I, I would propose that we could identify a private developer who would restore that property to the national interior standards. Um, then you place a historical restriction on that property, and then they, we could use that as, as regular housing or affordable housing. So that was an idea that's kind of floated out there. And so if anybody wants to provide feedback or other ideas, now's your time. Um, so we, we've had, we've had like ball, spitball estimates of, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. But that was just, and I should preface that by saying it was not for like the historical standards, so. Just to bring it back, if you wanted to rent the property to someone. Correct. As an office space, so. Correct. Can we add the wild? Yeah. Sure. 
Oh, yes, yeah, right. I don't think, oh my God, it's like karaoke. Very this bad. is not open mic night. <laughs> I have to hold it down here. Um, well, as an artist, I think some artist space for, I don't know, a live work artist house over there it might be cool. People could paint plein air or landscapes or that sort of thing. Okay. There's some great lines to it. It's got some great lines, meaning, yeah, exactly. yeah. agreed. Eighteen hundreds. Any idea when that was built up? I know you. Maybe Dan. Yes, go ahead. So, one of the questions I have is around: Do you happen to have a picture with the? You mentioned that part of the reason for purchasing it was to um, protect some frontage that was on Chestnut. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, is there any? possibility of subdividing it to be a portion of it that would be a pr the, pr the private residence and maintaining that frontage um, that was purchased for the concern of um, development, keeping that as open space? Is that a potential to do a s to subdivide that parcel? N no, but we could, we could put a restriction on that, that parcel, well, that well, piece so if we needed to. The reason why I'm asking this is that, that we keep that portion of the land, but yet, look, because one of the things that I, I mean, I do love the idea of having additional, um, the spaces that are mentioned, but, uh, but quite frankly, many of the historic homes that we have in this town are no longer homes, and I would love to see, as myself being a homeowner of a historic home, them be homes, and if the potential was there for someone to purchase it, and I would imagine, quite frankly, it would probably have to be at a very low cost, considering right. the um, the concern of how much it would cost to re rehabilitate it. I personally would like to see it be a home. Okay. So you like the Amy? You like the idea of selling it at, like you said, it'd be a low cost, or you know, maybe even giving it to somebody to rebuild mm -hmm. to the historic ha st standards and then um, with the convey with the, with the restrictions on it and then convey it to uh, somebody to live in as a home. Okay. Personally, yes. Okay. I may be of the minority there, but. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so this is the house, so this is Chestnut Street you mean you guys can't see this right here? Yeah. So this is Chestnut Street. This is the house. Um, the envelope is very small, and then the frontage extends out here. And it, it's, it's not very deep. Um, it just extends longer along Chestnut Street. Okay. Just relate while we're talking about history, we have a lot of openings on the historical commission. So wow, that yeah, was good. Yeah, yeah, very good. So we had some resignation. So, and also, I, um, what do we know about the history of this house? Is this where Henry Warren actually lived? Do people know? Yes, yes, Mr. Hackinson. Can you get him the microphone? Yeah, let's. <laughs> it's called the Hall House because it was owned by the Halls. And uh, this house, to answer your question, Joe, I don't know what the answer is other than the L 22 Elliott Street was built, the front was built in the 1820s, and the back was built in the 1920s. So I'm assuming that this is roughly the same age as, as, uh, as that the 1820s, someplace maybe 1840. But it was owned by someone, uh, all three of those houses were all separate farms at one point, and the Warrens bought uh, this farm from the halls and bought 22 Elliott Street as well. So, and your question about who lived there, um, it was Henry Warren's private workshop was in the basement of this house. Okay. And um, 
at least during my lifetime, um, people that worked for the Warrens lived there. And then when the Warrens deeded the land to Northeastern, um, the people that worked at the Warren Center lived there. Um, but uh, for instance, Mrs. Warren's nurse lived, uh, her family lived at that house at one point. So is this possibly where he invented the electric clock? Is this? Well, it, it's probably where he, well, the, the barn where behind it in the basement. Yeah. And I, I worked there years and years and years ago. And all of the, um, all of the early models of the clocks were still in the basement. Oh my God. Well, to point. me, that's ex extremely important. They've moved them since, but, yeah. but yes, that's where the workshop was. Well, so a lot of these houses that have historic value to them, um, you can actually go to the Massachusetts Secretary of State website. They have a database of these homes. It's called MACRIS, um, and you can find out a lot of information about this. And it's pretty easy to find, so much so that I just did it. Um, so this house was built in 1850, and um, the common name is the Warren Gear Company building, so it's pretty interesting. Pretty unique. How large is it? It's roomier than it appears from the outside. It is. Um, yeah, you probably don't want to see pictures of the inside of the house, Robin. <laughs> no. Okay. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you could give tours for Henry Warren's man cave, and it would be like inspirational. The kids could go in there and just by osmosis kind of get some really good ideas. Not clocks, we already got those, but the next big thing. What about, given the, the belief that this may be where he invented, you know, his first electric clock, what about, you know, um, a, a, a museum to Henry Warren, STEM facility for high school or middle school kids to do things along those lines? I don't know. That really okay. is a technology center there. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. We'll see if we have it. Yeah, we'll yeah. The last one was so. a microphone. Yeah. All right. That's right. So are we... Um, are we doing well on the video? Still have a few minutes on this one if we want to... Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if, all, if that's true, it really is a unique site in, in American te technological history. So, true. We have yeah. all the for right. Okay. Well, I will move on to the next one. I think we've... We have two minutes. We have two minutes? Oh. Well, we... Right. Okay. Um, next one is the Warren Barn. Um, so again, this was purchased as part of the transaction um, with Framingham State. Um, you see the, um, the historic silo there and the historic barn. Again, this one is eligible to be on the National Register as well. Um, again, since we purchased it using general funds, there are no restrictions on it. Um, strengths, I think the size, I, I should have said, of the building, not necessarily the property but the historic elements and, and then also the silo. Um, weaknesses, again, you've got a very similar situation where you have the cost to rehabilitate um, or rebuild. Um, and you also have an awkward lot. And some of the potential uses that uh, you know, we've talked about or we have heard um, is to use it as a storage space for either equipment or um, other needs. You could uh, replicate uh, the milking barn there. We could use it almost like as a function area. Uh, and again, I skipped over the second bullet. This is another one that could be part of the National Register as well. And uh, again, I think it's, imp you know, I might be alone in this thought, but I think it's important to uh, these buildings that we can find a way to put on the National Register. I think we should try to find a way to do it, but that's just my opinion. Um, 
you know, right now it's, you know, it's, it's fairly empty. I think, um, I think uh, Framingham State might still have a little bit of equipment there. Uh, we have had somebody go in and look at that, um, look at, you know, what it would cost to rehabilitate it. I believe that estimate, or basically not rebuild it, but rehabilitate it. It came in at about 350000 um, I think the person that we consulted with who does this type of stuff for a living said that it would probably be cheaper um, to, you know, raise it and then go ahead and rebuild it. So... Um, if that could potentially be an option as well. M Michael? Yes. On this one, doesn't the town already have some funds towards that process of rebuilding this? It's a good point. Um, the town, so when the town acquired Warren Woods, um, they also received, as part of that acquisition, um, $1 million from, the, uh, from Northeastern University. Um, and then we also received uh, money from Mass Audubon, and uh, we also received some money from the Green Company when they did their development at 466 Chestnut Street. Um, and so what this Board of Selectmen decided to do was actually create what's known as a Warren District. So are we, are like a, it's not an official historic district, but they have a Warren District, which encompasses, as I'm glad you brought that up, um, the Warren Barn, 22 Elliott Street, Warren Woods, and the Hall House. So um, we still have a large sum of money in that account that we can utilize for, you know, rehabilitating or, um, you know, doing this work. Um, but I want to be clear that we also have to use it to help maintain the properties that we have, maintain Warren Woods, et cetera. So, um, any thoughts on this one? Michael, just a quick question. Uh, so, Aaron Ladd, um, I'm less concerned with the what for these three properties, a little bit more concerned with the how do you do something. I'm over here at least once a week, and I had no idea these are town properties, um, either visually or web-based or anything. Um, I think the first step to really start to get a sense that these are available for help is to take the information we're doing here tonight and make it more public. Um, whether we create a website or we update the town website, I think it helps to let the town know that here's a list of properties that we own, um, and then photos on the web, something. Um, I honestly thought this was Framingham State. I was there three hours ago, um, and I thought that was Framingham State. There's no sign there that says town property. There's no anything. Um, so something that you help marketing, help advertisement, help something. They just kind of let people know okay, these are all the town properties, we're looking to do stuff now, uh, creating a sense that we're open for business. Otherwise, they're gonna lay fallow for the next five, 10 years. Um, the first word is getting the word out there that something's going on. So this is a good first start as a meeting, but uh, a lot of towns list their assets online, as well as they use their town website to be able to look up, well, who owns that property? You can't do that in Ashland. You can't figure out who owns a piece of parcel um, via mapping or on a town list. So I think it's important to let people know this is what we really own and then communicate to everyone. Yeah, it's just go to the assessor's database. Yeah. But he has a good point about I, I'm sorry, but the assessor's database is really clumsy to find. Um, it's a lot easier in a lot of other towns. So. Yeah, gotcha. That's a good point for our next steps mm -hmm. discussion. Um, I have a question. So I guess it's sort of related. I, I like the idea of the uh, Warren District, and I think that we could do a better job marketing that. And I, I think that our town alone, just our tax dollars, are not going to support all these properties without having them lie fallow or fall apart. And I don't think most people want to see that. I think there's a way to do this. And so I think that comes up like what is what's the zoning because I know there's a hotel over there but is it all just residential and do we have to start looking at that way or are there other because I think we really have to we have to market this right we can work with Beth through economic development and I I mean I'm not the one to decide that but I think common sense was do we can we have a way to work with somebody and still preserve this for the town get have access maybe as historic things and and um, 
and I think that's the way to go, but I think obviously the zoning has to be looked at. It's kind of piggybacking on Aaron's comments there. Uh, one thought, we bought this because Framingham State didn't have enough money, essentially, to buy the whole thing and to make the deal work. But does, that doesn't necessarily mean that Framingham State wouldn't have interest in this property sometime in the future. We could talk to them about, well, do you actually want to acquire this in the future? Do you have a, would you like to have a plan to uh, when you get the money? And that could change what we want to do because selling to Framingham State would not be a bad option uh, if they have a, a good vision for it. Um, we didn't buy this because they didn't have enough money for it. We bought it because they were going to knock them down. Okay. You got the one. <laughs> this screams to be to be an arts and crafts center. I mean, it's an old milking barn. It's open. You have people going in there and buying stuff from the artists. I haven't seen the inside of it, but it. it I mean, it's a big open floor. If it's a milking barn, it's a big open floor plan. And I, I don't use, like to use the word flea market, but in an indoor flea market or an indoor farmer's market, I mean, you don't have to do a lot to, to get that approved. Mm. It's not like you have to have a sprinkler system or... So I own a business. I'm a small Hi, business Candy. owner. Hi, I'm a photographer, and I use this barn all the time. I'm not the only photographer around here that uses this barn for almost every photo shoot. Um, it is the backdrop for almost all of my photographs. And I was just sitting here thinking, talking to Kara, and Elm Bank is also another location that I use, and they now charge photographers a sponsor fee um, for utilizing their, their grounds. Um, back in the day when I started my business, I didn't pay a dime. Now I'm paying $180 a year. So that's each photographer. Um, to use just their grounds. And it's also scheduled, so I have to contact somebody to actually schedule that appointment with my client. So this is actually not a bad idea because there's other photographers that use this. They also use the, across the street, there's that big open field. I use that as well. Um, I use the white house that's also on this property. Mm -hmm. I use all the grounds all around it. I've been kicked out a couple of times, but, <laughs> but it is a great, great barn, and I'm so glad that I had no idea that we owned it. Um, so this is awesome. I think it's a, another option that maybe, you know, could be managed in that way. Candy, one, one question. So you pay $180 a year for Elm, it's Elm, Elm Bank, Bank and Wellesley. Um, I mean, would you pay that to have the, as a business person, would you pay that to... And I don't in mean to put you on a spot. <laughs> um, I don't know as I would pay $180. I think that seems kind of high. Okay. Elm Bank is really large. Okay. Um, there's a ton of backdrops there for a photographer. Um, you know, like 100 bucks. you know, would be fair. You use the whole, we, uh, we call it the Warren District that, that's right across the street. So if $185 covers that whole area, yeah. would that be... Amenable yep. to, to another photographer. I'm just throwing it up. I yeah, know. I don't know. I'd have to. And like I said, I don't yeah. mean to put you on the spot, but this is very important because a lot of times we come up with ideas that are like, yeah, why don't we charge or make a developer do this yep. or do this? And it might not, the developer might not do that or the professional. They so might the not want to pay that for The only for challenge that I can do. foresee is possibility that the, the sort of managing it um, because, you know, anyone can really walk on the property right. without you knowing. Um, so to steward that would be difficult, I think. So Elm Bank did change their entry to actually ensure that you couldn't get in. And also if you're caught walking around the grounds taking photographs, they do ask you for that membership card. Um, so, you know, there are some pieces that you would really have to iron out. Um, so is this... You know, as, as I listen and um, as I've had conversations, is this a historic district that we create a place for people to come, right? If we spend some of the, and, and 
I don't know this is the right thing, but we have money from getting the Warren Woods, right? Do we take some of that money and, cre and turn the Hall House into a museum and we fix the barn and we, you know, look at, you know, and having to work with the right committees that are managing all these pieces of property, create a visitor center at 22 Elliott where then we're charging people to come into this historic district. I think about Mystic Seaport. And, you know, it's educational and then also it's revenue generating. And if we have a public part, private partnership with someone who can help us do this, is this then something that we can generate some interest, keep our history alive, and maybe even generate more interest in that history? Um, Yolanda, that's a great idea. And the black, I don't know if people know, but the Blackstone Valley, one guy in the 80s, just decided to make this whole thing historic and he just went crazy and now it is. And so if, if we decide we wanna do that, the other thing I wanted to say is that silo is a gem and I tried to get Hopkinton to not tear theirs down but they didn't listen to me. If you go to the Midwest, they treat these silos like gold. They have grants, just Google it. And Massachusetts, because we've got so much stuff, we've gotten very lax on taking care of stuff. But I think you could probably get a grant even for the silo, because that thing's incredible, and, and people don't even know it. Yeah. Oh, Kate, say it. Um, I know there is what Julie's talking Midwest, but someone made a recording studio out of the silo, and it was really awesome. So there's, we, we really have a lot of possibilities with that area, and we should <laughs> put on thinking caps. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, silo is solid. Solid. Um, I don't want to be negative about it, but I, when I hear charging people to come to our historic district, I laugh inside. Like, I can't imagine paying to come to a historic district in Ashland. I don't feel like it has enough to offer. Mystic Seaport is amazing. Like, I mean, Connecticut, I mean, I don't know. I just, sure. it's just my own opinion. I don't see it being sustainable and drawing people here from outside, um, but that's just my own. Thought. Well, I th you know what, I think, I think the benefit of having these kind of conversations is that you're not gonna come up with a silver bullet that takes care of all of this, but you can start combining a lot of different things. So maybe, you know, if you have a true national historic district, that's gonna make you eligible for more grants that you could utilize then to help maybe fix up your buildings and fix up your properties. And then maybe you do have something like Candy mentioned at a, you know, at a different rate where people can use it professionally um, for professional services, which could help maintain the property. Uh, certainly, I don't think you could generate enough to you know, do some big capital projects, but hopefully enough to maintain it. And um, yeah, maybe you have that, you know, you just take like again an amalgamation of different ideas and, and make something great yeah, out of it. Part of what we want to generate tonight are ideas, you know, that help us as, as we look at all this and think about what to do next. So feel free to say something that's pretty out there, and you know, we'll laugh at you. But you know, then, <laughs> but this is you know idea generated too. So any any other thoughts about this or the, even the Warren District? How many of you knew that the Board of Selectmen had done the Warren District? Kate? Okay. Okay, we've got to publicize that. <laughs> yeah. All right. But it is, it's a good, you know, it's a good cohesive concept, the Warren District. You know, so. All right. All right, next property. Um, Girl Scout property. So those of you that are very familiar with this off of Olive Street, um, it is, this entrance is bounded by two nice granite posts there. Um, so this is a little bit of a unique property. So in terms of the way we purchased it and the restrictions that we have. So um, when we originally wanted to purchase the property and found out that it was going to be on the market, um, you know, the prevailing thought was that um, we were going to explore the possibility of turning the aggregate quarry into a wastewater treatment facility to help address um, a lot of our wastewater needs and especially our sewer costs. 
Um, and then this property was going to serve as a leaching field for the clean effluent. Um, so we actually purchased this with sewer enterprise funds. So if we decide to do something besides this, eventually we're going to have to reimburse the sewer fund back and, and you know, get things squared away. Um, so anyway, that's that. I think some of the strengths related to it, um, again, the location to the quarry, if you want to do something like a, a wastewater treatment facility. The size of the parcel, it's about 20 acres. It's, it's wooded. Those of you that have been there, it's, it's a very, um, very beautiful, um, beautiful place. Um, it had already been utilized. It's been closed up um, and boarded up when we took possession of it. And it's proximity to the state park, so it kind of creates this contiguous um, area around the reservoir. Um, weaknesses, um, we don't know for sure whether or not a wastewater uh, treatment plant would be f feasible. And getting access to the property off of Olive Street and down into where some of the buildings are could be, um, could be difficult. Uh, some of the potential uses that we talked about, um, again, a leaching field for a wastewater treatment facility. Um, and then also Ashland recreation programming or some kind of recreational aspect. Um, Kelly Run, those of you who know Kelly, um, is chomping at the bit to, you know, have us make a decision as to what to do because there's really a lot of opportunities for Ashland recreation to use this, partnerships with the YMCA, et cetera. So, uh, having said that, we'll open it up for discussion. Are, are folks familiar with it? Have you walked, the, you know, where the boarded up buildings are and they, they had a little dock there and, you know, to me it seems like a, you know, a place for a great town recreation site on the reservoir, so. What was the purchase price? 400000 um, Having, I, back when my, years ago, stayed at the Girl Scout camp uh, for encampment <laughs> with my daughter. Um, and having been there and done that experience with her, I feel like it's a great place for recreation for, you know, if Kelly has ideas like to work with her, like I would love to see it used for kids in nature and exploring. Um, so. yeah. <clears throat> uh, I'd still like to see one of the options be return it to nature, meaning it is surrounded by untouched woods and I wouldn't be opposed to having a return to that, meaning remove the buildings, remove the trails, return it to nature. Um, doesn't need to have a use, doesn't need to have a purpose, just conservation land. Um, yes, there are buildings on site, but I think they're potentially being used for kids and teenagers and things that might not be want to be used there. And it is, it pulls together the entire loop around the state park in a conservation sense. Um, and me personally, I think it would just be great to return it to nature, not a use. So. What are the shapes of the building? What condition they're in? So you've got one main building um, that was like the offices. Structurally, it's pretty good. I mean, the windows have been broken and boarded up. And then you have some tent platforms as well. And, you know, I don't know much about you know, the structural integrity of tent platforms, but they seem to be pretty good. Um, Has anyone thought about a warming pad or a place where you can cross cut these ski, uh, run place to stop? So like a warming hut or for when people are utilizing it in the winter or, or things of that nature? What's the acreage? 20 acres. Well, that's a big site. I, I spoke with Mike Crisofoli today about a number of these things, plus I went and saw some of them, but uh, this one he said, the building is pretty good. They, they drained it down, they mothballed it, there's a fully functioning kitchen, it is built, you could do assembly uses in there. It has ADA accessible bathrooms and stuff like that. So of the, of the, the, the whole collection of these, it has the most potential if you wanted to use it for something. He said you could probably just, you know, hook it back up and go on with these. But he said there are cabins out in the back that are in pretty much in disrepair. Um, so I, I don't know. Those were storage cabins. Yeah. He didn't know how many there were. Hmm. For the camp. For the camp. But he said, he said you know, they're kind of open. They're in bad shape. There's a lot of stuff in them. So um, anyway, that's a, I don't have a clue. I haven't even thought about it. 
Okay. I mean, we have so many of these things that we're not getting any value out of in terms of income. And it's so much overhead and outgo, maintenance. We'll probably get to put people on, hire more people on DPW to be able to uh, handle it. Sorry I got here late. I had a plumber who would come to my house, and that was the most important yeah, thing. I, well, <laughs> yeah, and Sarah, I, I think you missed my, my opening, and some of you might have, have come in late. Um, look, I know we've acquired a number of these properties. And you know, part of it is because we don't always have the opportunity to time when these things come on the market. So um, we've just taken the opportunity to um, you know, acquire them so we do have site control over them um, as opposed to letting them go and be developed or, or whatever. So. You know, I, I know you can't go back in time, but it's, you know, growing up with Kyle and Robin and you know, I've been fortunate enough to live on the reservoir for like 35 years. It's just sad to see that um, the place isn't utilized by the Girl Scouts anymore. They, they taught them how to sail. They taught them how to canoe the outside, you know, not kids always looking at their iPhones, their iPads, you know. It was like, I can remember them making campfires and stuff, you know, and it's just like a th thing you just hate to see disappear off the, off the planet, you know. It's... If there's any way to get the kids back into a setting like that, maybe even use, as she stated, just for functions like part-time, not just like a warming hut, but to util utilize the site. It's gorgeous land, you know, and it's, you know, I just hate to see it, you know, I'll probably be dead by then, but turn into a, um, you know, a sewage treatment drainage area or whatever. It's just... It's pristine. It's really nice in there. And uh, it's a lot of wildlife. And, uh, you know, I just, I just remember seeing countless kids out on that water, you know. And it, it really did your heart good to see it, you know. And now kids, the only kids I see outside of my neighbor's Joe's kids playing outside, you know. No kids play outside anymore. Mm -hmm. Anything we can do to encourage that, I think we should look at. Okay. I think this use would be great. Um, this space would be wonderful to use for its purpose. Like if we let Kelly run run with this, I, I think the possibilities are endless. Right now, um, my kids go to the the rec camp every summer, and it's lovely. But they, you know, they walk down to the the state park beach area. But if they could go and and you know, use canoes and kayaks and any of that kind of stuff on this waterfront, it'd be amazing. Right now they bust them to Hopkinton right. to do that stuff. Yeah. And I mean, I go to Hopkinton to use the paddle boarding and all the, um, I think it's called like boating in Boston or something, sure. the company that runs that stuff. Why couldn't we keep some of that money, you know, in Ashland? Um, you could even do something like, like an overnight summer camp there. Um, I think that'd be a great option. And I could see, you know, local parents sending their kids there just to try out an overnight camp for a few nights. Um, but it seems like the infrastructure is there if we just restore it. I think it would be awesome. Thank you. One thing is our zoning does not allow overnight camping in Ashland, which could be changed. Um, because I always thought there was great potential when the marathon comes to having camping either in Ashland State Park. But this is another choice. When you could charge for it, it would not actually, you know, pay for itself. You get you know, a week's worth of opening for people that, you know, do the marathon on a budget. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. Is there, you know, any interest in a town beach around there? Any, but what do people think of that idea? Is it, well, we have, we're what, we're a town we have without Ashland a town State beach. Park. What's that? We have Ashland State Park. Isn't there a pool up there? Wasn't yeah, there people like that. I'm just saying there's no interest in a town beach for, in this crowd. No? Nobody? Yeah, if you go there, yeah, so there's kind of a dock and it's a rocky coastline there and you could, you know, but there's no beach and you know, I'm just trying to get the idea if there's anybody thinking that way. It wouldn't take yeah. much to make that a place where you could launch, you know, kayaks. That's a yeah, little more launch, easy. Launch boats. Yeah, there's, there's some people, people in the back, back there. Come up and grab the microphone. Sarah's got it, so she'll keep it if you let her, so. <laughs> <laughs> I just, um, just keep in mind how narrow that road is, that entrance road, and it's really, I don't know how much you can make it wider because of the wetlands at the beginning of the road. 
So I don't know if you want to do the boating in Boston thing. I don't think we want a lot of, I mean, I know the Girl Scouts had like buses come in. I think they, mm. I think they discourage a lot of cars coming in. Yeah, it's still, you know, a dirt road. I think it would, I mean, if you were gonna have a lot of traffic, I think you would have to find a way to widen it and pave it. We talk about partnerships with uh, other agencies and other groups. This would probably would not be a bad idea to do some partnership with uh, with DCR, uh, with the state, where they're in charge of the state parks, um, and do some sort of uh, joint venture where we're so close to the state park itself, and um, and utilize that piece of property with the camp, and um, with the joint effort of developing and putting in a boat ramp and eliminating the boat ramp off of Spring Street. Now, I know that's, you may smell smoke, it's in my head. Um, one, one of the things that I, that I was, was looking at and, and going over is that the state and the town is actually, we spent a lot of money down there on, on police details and other, and other matters because it's just, if you went down there on a weekend, during the summertime, you know you can't get through. So if you eliminate that boat ramp, now the state will also make money because now the people have to go into the state park to utilize the boat ramp, which is what they do in Hopkinton. Right now, nobody's paying anything, and they're using the nice reservoir for nothing if they use the boat ramp that's on Spring Street. But if you put that boat ramp in the state park and jointly put it in that area in between where the camp is and the park itself, that's a, that's a pretty good idea, and it's a pretty good location. And now you can have that, the canoeing programs. You can have all those other programs that are available and offered to the kids. They don't have to go someplace else. They can stay local. So just a thought, just an idea, and maybe it's something that we should uh, address with uh, uh, state legislators. Uh, legislators. Uh, one more thought. Uh, corporate, corporates pay for retreats. Huge money for retreats like this. Oh, absolutely right. Huge money. Right. And we could call it I Nature. <laughs> like it. What? I Phone, iPad, I Nature. How important is So, so the question is, um, you know, how high of a priority is a wastewater treatment facility in Ashland, and you know, where does it where does it rank on the list? Um, so I think, you know, everybody knows that our sewer rates are really, really high, especially when you start comparing them to other MWRA communities. So I know the Board of Selectmen have really, you know, want to focus on trying to relieve some of that pressure. Um, the main thing that the most comprehensive thing to do would be to have a wastewater treatment facility. Um, but they're also looking at another option, which is actually a direct pipe to the MWRA system, which would be a lot cheaper, uh, but we wouldn't save as much money. Um, so I would say it's probably, I'd say on the middle range of the priority list. Uh, I think one of the things that we're trying to do is actually put that priority list together, as opposed to just saying we wanna do everything. Um, but I would say it's probably around the middle range. We're going to have a feasibility study done in, in this fiscal year to look at the feasibility of doing a wastewater treatment facility versus a, a direct connection. I don't know of any other locations where we could put it, but that doesn't mean that there are none. And I think, uh, just Michael, uh, when we looked at it, we weren't envisioning the actual plant itself being on the property. Right, just right, it was the, going to be the, the leaching field. Just the leaching field, which, you know, I think we were told at the time could be fairly non-environmentally damaging. I guess it's just a, a system of pipes in, in the trees that, you know, leach the, the treated wastewater back into and the ground. There would be no, no digging into the ground. The pipes would lie on the top and the water would uh, drain into the ground itself and yeah. just so maybe grab the fuse. Well, I think that was the thought, was we right. could have both recreational and have it, you know, for at least some wastewater treatment purpose, so. I, should, if, I know you've been down there, you, you, you do a lot of walking and stuff, but when you, when you go down the road, you'll see there's a dirt driveway to the right. Well, the property that we're talking about putting that wastewater treatment facility drainage area 
is beyond the, the right side. It has, it's not even near the, the camp area in and of itself. The camp will be maintained on its own, uh, on its own uh, area, and it has nothing to do with the area that we're looking to put the drainage area. Well, I, I, I agree with you. Absolutely. Thank you. I think something else that's really interesting about this property is it sort of has um, bench seating built into it already. So that's kind of ripe for community education, outdoors, maybe outdoor performance theater or something like that. But I mean, using it for Ashland Rec, I just, I think that's kind of unique that it's already built in there. That's stuff that we can fix up. We don't have to necessarily start from zero to have an area like that. Well, the Eagle Skull projects could be done in there. I love it. And, <laughs> And, you know, I don't want to underestimate the potential of a partnership with the YMCA that's right or just over in Hopkinton. Now, the interesting thing is, Julie, I know you brought up the idea of doing like an amphitheater type of uh, performing arts thing like Allison just, just mentioned. Um, the YMCA in Hopkinton, you know, just across the street was actually looking at doing something very similar on their property. So maybe it's something that there's, maybe they'll pay to, you know, fix it up and redo it in exchange for using some of the space. Um, or having scheduled space? I, I think one of the common themes we're seeing here is the potential, but also the need to actually manage it and who's going to have the time and the resources to actually make all these things possible. And that's, um, that's a big part of the challenge, I think. Yeah. I mean, one thing we, we, you know, we talked a lot about with this property with recreation and, and Kelly's programs and, um, you know, in anticipation of a greater need in, of our recreation programs and doing more comprehensive programming, uh, town meeting did add an assistant a recreation director, a part-time director, and that person actually should start pretty soon. So I could see this as being one of their major projects. Don't tell Kelly I said that, but, you know. If and she's watching, she just fell. Yes, yeah, she did. Um, any other comments on, on this property? Kate, are you getting up for this property? Okay. Um, I just had one thing, because I guess you talked about like sheds and disrepair, and I just, I feel like we have to go baby steps and maybe clean up and, and have a community work day, right? And we'll have to get the DPW and stuff, but like it's our property, it's our town, and we do care about it, and we have to start acting like that. And like if we want to get other people interested or even with recreation, let's not give them a mess. So let's kind of, focus on the little things we can do on that. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, the next property that we're going to talk about is a property that the town has had for a while, um, the Simpson property slash Weston Nurseries. Um, it's right off of Olive Street, almost kind of across the street from uh, Camp Winnetaska. Um, so it has a number of restrictions because it was purchased with uh, CPA funds, uh, recreational, open space, and affordable housing funds. Um, strengths, I, I think total lot size is around 30 acres. Anybody want to dispute that? Uh, 25? Okay. We round up, you know. Um, weaknesses, it does have a lot of, you know, wetlands around the property. Um, I'm not saying wetlands are a weakness, but I'm just saying it has to you know, it, it impacts what you can do. Um, the potential uses, so this uh, Community Preservation Committee actually came forward, I think a couple of months ago, and talked about um, a plan for this property that incorporated um, a small Habitat for Humanity project, I think it was a couple of duplexes maybe, two, um, and then using the rest of the property for um, walking trails and, and more passive recreation. Um, I think the Affordable Housing Trust were thinking, was thinking maybe something a little bit larger in terms of an affordable housing development. I don't know if you had any, any thoughts. I'm looking well, there at was, her. There was, there was, there's actually a design that's, uh, that we have available for people to take a look at. Um, it, we had three houses uh, facing. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm, what we had originally was we had three uh, houses avail uh, facing Olive Street and then a, a roadway closer to um, the Clinton Road area uh, in between uh, Clinton Street and um, Mr. Bosworth's property. There would have been a roadway to go through there and then, and then halfway through, because we have to be very careful. There's a lot of 
uh, wetland delineation that, uh, that when we did the delineation, we were able to, we lost some land that we thought we could use, but because we couldn't. So that made the, uh, the number of units smaller with an open uh, space backfield in there for, for the purposes of uh, recreational walking or making it into a small field for, for, for a play area, for passive recreation type of uh, area. And that would abut the uh, Warren, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Woodland Road residents. So they, wouldn't have, they would not have had a, a development right behind their property. That open space would have been like used as a buffer as well. Um, so that project uh, is still on, is on the books. We did put out an RFP, um, and uh, one of the in, in, one of the contractors that did come up uh, said it would be too costly for them. They weren't going to make any money on it, so they uh, they withdrew their uh, their their offer. So uh, these are some of the things and some of the problems that we as a affordable housing trust are, uh, are coming upon. We have ideas, we have plans that we'd like to see done, but because the economy right now is so rich. And there's many projects out there, the contractors aren't hungry. So they're picking and choosing what they want to do. So we have to wait for the economy to really slide so we can get some of these other projects on the run, unfortunately. So. All right. Kara? Hi, I'm Kara Terrell. Um, I actually, years and years ago, rode horses at this Simpson property. Uh, it used to be a barn. It, well, it still has the barn there and then the property. Um, as a member of the dog park committee, we actually had uh, walked this land and spoke with a conservation agent about this land, and this is a possibility for uh, maybe a multi-use inclusive of a dog park. There's several acres that are um, cohesive together that don't... Um, that aren't impacted by the wetlands. We were told that that is a probability that we could at least use some of it. And there is some parking, there would be some potential for some parking there, which is also um, a positive for what we're looking for. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to say, and this kind of is about some of the other properties too, is um, using it for a collaborative effort. Like, I think it's called the Baylor Building. Oh. Did we just lose our live mic? Baylor Building in Framingham. And it's on the Fountain Street. It used to be a department store years and years ago, and it's an old factory. And what they used it for was artists would rent little um, rooms there, yeah. and end up selling their wares and products from the little rooms. And I thought it was fascinating, not only generating some income for the building or the or the landowner, um, but also using that the artists um, and showcasing their items. And the third piece I wanted to say is I would really like to find a place for kids that are more of the middle school age and the high school age. I know they don't always hang out, but years ago at the um, police station, there was a barn behind there as well, where it was more of a community center where people could, kids could come and hang out and they could have social services there if they needed it, or just hang out. Not to have so much structured time, but just to have some time um, to do nothing, basically. And that's it, thank you. The barn, yeah. Any, any other thoughts on this? I know I see several members of our CPC committee yeah. here. Um, I hope I did your plan justice in, in the description. If there's something else you want to add to it or maybe add a little bit more detail or color to it. I, I, just, have a, I just have a question on the um, Habitat for Humanity project. Mm -hmm. Is that still on the table? I, th I think Habitat and Humanity. It's proposed. Proposed. Okay. Yeah. That'd be great. Good. Yeah, come on up. Sure. So, I'm happy to talk. Uh, Donna Saul, I live on Woodland Road, and um, but also a member of CPC. Um, so we had Habitat come out just to talk to us, just to say, what are you guys all about, and. Um, I, I don't want to speak for the whole committee, but certainly I, I was extremely uh, impressed with what they do for the people that they serve. They don't just build the house and say, hey, good luck, you know, go on. They, they support these people through the house ownership process. They help them to become part of the community. They engage the community in um, the project so that um, we are all invested in this family, in this home. They make sure the home is compatible with the community. 
Um, I, they, it, it's a really great program. Um, and so that, that was part of what inspired CPC to come and talk to the Board of Selectmen about, um, you know, could we think about going forward with this on land that the town owns because we don't have the authority to do that. So that was the impetus um, after they came to us and just told us what a great program they have. Beautiful. Yeah. Is it affordable housing outside housing or um, rentable low-income rent? So it's. Yes. Thank you. Um, so they purchase. They 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 give them a zero percent mortgage to purchase. Um, what they were talking to us about was two duplexes. So there would be four affordable units for the town, uh, um, and so but these people have become homeowners. Um, and they teach them how to be a homeowner, they teach them how to maintain property, they teach them how to be part of a community, and they keep track of them over time, um, and then they keep the property in the community, um, it, it, I mean, in the affordable side of the community, so that um, they, uh, if they sell, it, it stays affordable housing and they continue to, to so work with it. Um, be, no, it's, it's it's low cost. The, much of the project is subsidized, so the community gets involved with sweat equity. Thank you. Um, they would perhaps look to CPC to fund uh, a project so that part of the the building costs are funded. They encourage the community to get involved in fundraising um, as well as the sweat equity. So there's a lot of components to it, a lot of opportunity for involvement, um, and they it, they just do a really nice job. Right. Or another. Yeah. I had the There's opportunity a, to um, be part of one of the women's builds yeah. for the Hopkins, for the Holliston projects. And they reach out to, you know, so as builders, we formed a team with Beth Reynolds and a, a number of people, and we, de we decide to fundraise. So we fundraise. We donate our time for the day, and then we also donate the money that we've received um, to Habitat for Humanity to help pay for some of the materials. But it's definitely a program where they look to the community to participate. And Ashland, again, is one of those communities where we, so many people have big hearts and like to help. So it's, it's a win-win. And the people that get the homes are usually very thankful, and it would be very difficult for them to purchase a home someplace else. Yeah, we, oh, no, go ahead, Sarah. I can't say, um, I can't, my knees will seize up if yeah. I have to stand for a long period of time, but I could sit down and talk forever. <laughs> but uh, what I'm saying is how much acreage is wetlands, how much acreage is buildable, is there town water and sewer to the side? It all affects the feasibility of doing anything like that. And is the proposal that the town then gives the land or sells the land to Habitat for Humanity? Do you hold it as a, in land trust? Is it a land lease? Or, you know, what, how would you propose to do it? I think we're just Somebody. at the beginning of that process. So. I think those are questions okay. that would have to be answered. Okay. Because yeah. I mean, it's 22, 23, or even 30 acres is a lot. If you're like, to only put four houses on, it sounds like a, a waste. But, uh, yeah. The CPC proposal on this was that um, you can stay if you want, but no. the CPC proposal was for not just these two units, but it was open space behind it, and yeah. there was it was kind of like a whole package for the entire parcel. Yeah. So they wouldn't own the twenty something acres, but they don't small. The yeah, the town would own the. the. No, I just wanted the, the question of how much is buildable versus wetlands, I'm David Saul. Um, it's about 50% wetlands, and I say that having walked the site, so um, there's a bit of frontage on olive, and then to get to the back land, it's a very narrow kind of bit of dry land, so it's about 50% wetlands, 50% other. And I think, you know, we've talked about some major, you know, themes. Uh, I th well, I think the only major theme we've really talked about is like historical elements and preserving historical elements. But I think certainly a couple of other important things are open space and then also affordable housing. And, you know, especially with affordable housing, I think we've got two main focuses. We've got our 
our numbers, getting our numbers up to where we can, uh, would I say, immunize ourselves against 40B applications, which gives us more local control over development. But then we also have the moral, um, the moral obligation of affordable and workforce housing as well. And I think this, um, and the Habitat project would fit firmly with that. So, all right, we're going to move on to our final property. Um, this one has actually been in use for a little while. It's uh, 22 Elliott Street. Um, it's uh, basically that intersection of Chestnut and Elliott Street, you know, the new development that's gone in by the Green Companies, uh, 466 Chestnut. Well, this is a house um, and land that they actually donated to the town as uh, part of that transaction. There were 40 acres. Um, they ended up developing 20 acres and gifting 20 acres to the town, roughly, approximately. And um, the part that they gifted was um, included this house, which is the old 4-H house, the old 4-H offices. Um, some work's gone into it uh, since we've acquired it. You know, we've repainted it. We've um, worked on the mechanicals, the HVAC system. Um, you know, redid the roof. Did um, did a lot of work on it. And so now it's it's currently and it will be under the control of uh, the conservation commission. Uh, for and Carl, help me out here. It's for conservation purposes and you know. What happens when you hang around in the back like that? Uh, the deed restriction, when it was deeded from the green company to the town, um, said that it needed to, that they, they were deeding it to the Conservation Commission for educational and conservation, conservation purposes. purposes. So those are the restrictions that are on that. Um, I think some of the strengths, again, it has been maintained and kind of brought up to speed, uh, the mechanicals especially. Um, it is historic. Um, weaknesses that that equipment, some of it is older. And then also it lacks ADA accessibility, which limits its use as a public building. Um, and then potential uses, uses, it's actually being used as this right now. I mean, almost, it almost has a museum quality to it if you, if you have been in there. Um, and then it's also been used as a learning center and almost as a base of operations. You could think of it as almost like a base of operations for Framingham State and the work that their environmental department does out in Warren Woods. Um, and, you know, I don't foresee that changing unless there is, I mean, uh, you know, people have a lot of other ideas, but um, we thought we would include this as part of it. I just wanted to add that um, the uh, Upswing Farm has a lease on the uh, field between the house and Chestnut Street. That's correct. So it's, it's currently being utilized. Any thoughts or ideas about this? Sarah, why don't you just tell me now. Yeah. It occurred to me that an affordable housing trust could take this over and have it as an affordable rental. You know, that's straightforwardly, that's one thing you could do with it. Because it's, it's got a restriction, yep. Why is there a conservation uh, restriction on it? It's a, it was a, it's a deed restriction. So you can't have residential in it? No. Oh, because the whole thing, anytime you go into a, a museum, you're talking about staff and how, you know, we had that discussion about the Marathon Museum is, you think of it, you have to do a business plan to see if what's going to work if you do that. I mean, Learning Center is the same thing unless you give it to the schools to do it that way. So, because I, I did miss out, is that other little cottage, the old uh, Henry Warren cottage in this group too? It's down uh, Chestnut Street at the end of the big swath. It doesn't have the restrictions. Okay, so you could put it out with affordable housing. I've been in that one. It was, it's okay as a single family. It probably couldn't be broken up, but it's where the electric clock was invented. So it's worth sort of doing something with. But again, museum, forget it. It's probably best use for uh, affordable housing. You can control it, so, okay. Does this property generate income? No, no. And, and that's one of those situations I think that, you know, we talked about actually with the Valentine Estate. So, um, 
you know, so Upswing Farm helps maintain it, you know, helps keep, keep that field um, in good shape. And in exchange, they get to, they're able to utilize their, you know, use, utilize it for, uh, for crops. So there's not necessarily, it's more of a barter, I guess you could think, uh, think of as opposed to any kind of money change in the hands. Well, so Robin, to that point though, so let's say it, it costs us $20,000 a year, right, to maintain it. And Upswing or some other farm pays us $10,000 a year. So we would be out $10,000 a year to help maintain that property, right? But isn't it better if you work out an agreement with like an Upswing farm to where they maintain it in exchange for for being able to lease it, and that way the town's not out any money. So even though you're not necessarily generating income, you know, the, the debits and the credits aren't necessarily happening, you're getting value, right? I think exactly. what makes this property unique is it didn't cost the town a dime, and it doesn't cost the town a dime. It was donated to us from uh, the green property, uh, for the green company, with that deed restriction on it for those purposes. But they also gave us uh, uh, a sizable amount of money to renovate the house and, and to keep it running. So it doesn't cost us anything. And we thought it was uh, the idea of keeping farming in Ashland because there's so little farming left in Ashland. Uh, and we were trying to help uh, the people at Upswing Farm up the street uh, to enhance their presence, uh, and to Michael's point, it also helps us maintain that field so that the stewardship committee doesn't have to maintain it. That's a nice balance. Uh, so just one strategy for historic houses uh, is always to consider, are they in the right location? Meaning, moving historic houses has become very popular in New England lately, and the ability to either put them all in a similar location or more efficient uses of spaces. Um, so I just encourage us to think protecting the property, but also is the house in the right spot? And that economics of scale, say you put multiple historic properties together, put them on other town on land, you make farming land all farming, you make housing areas all historic. So again, in this property, it's surrounded by farmland. Does that house really wanna be there or does it wanna be somewhere else? I don't know the right. answer to that question, but do it's a question historic properties be want to be in the right location? Mm -hmm. And there have been lots of historic properties that have moved um, and still count as historic. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, so, yeah. I sort of agree. I so wish I had been here for the Valentine th um, discussion because that and, and the, the silo property, because if we don't quickly put roofs on those and, and mothball them, they're going to be gone anyway. And there's n almost nothing salvageable about the Valentine Barn except the giant timbers inside. Another logical thing, I remember we often were saying that could be a good arts building. Move it over to the, the big open area at Warren Woods. Ditto this thing. You could have a, a, kind of a little assemblage of really interesting stuff, but you could do, you know, if you had art space, you could lease it. You could get a little bit of income from that, but there's so many different ways. But the only thing I wanted to say is the mo biggest priority is these older things that are falling apart, that are open, that are subject to vandalism, fire. That includes the 4-H camp, too. Um, got to sort of mothball them really quick. You know, cheap board up and uh, blue tarps or something. Those roofs are open and just pouring right. in. Well, to, and that's a very good point. And I think... <clears throat> no matter what you do, yeah. So, what, so we've done that with um, the Valentine property especially. I don't know if anybody knows our a facilities person, Joe Richardson, but he's done a, a really good job as well as, you know, Carl and a number of other volunteers of um, putting together a plan to, like you said, mothball the Valentine property, the barn and the house, until there is a decision made as to what to do. So, you know, plugging up the holes in the roof, um, ripping out the carpet because that holds moisture. Um, something was, we've, we've done something similar with the Hall House. You know, we've cleared out, uh, you know, a lot of the brush that, you know, holds a lot of moisture within the envelope. So, 
Points well taken. Jim. Hi, uh, Jim Zabrowski. Just want to segue from the, the time is of the essence and uh, others have mentioned the idea of having committees formed to work on these, maybe perhaps each of these properties. And the important part of it is to keep the energy in it, keep the ball rolling and have, have a small enough group that can focus on these things and just keep the energy in it. Yeah. Really all I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah, it, it strikes me as one of the biggest challenges here is the process and how do we keep moving forward and how to make these kind of decisions and who's going to have the time to, to do this, you know, whether we're forming committees for each property or a larger committee or what is the kind of strategic process here. I think that's one of the challenges that we face coming out of these meetings and how to, how to put all these ideas into, uh, into reality. So. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we're talking about these property-specific issues, right? But one thing that we haven't talked about is how they fit into a bigger picture. And I think it's important, you know, some people think I'm anti-development, some people think I'm pro-development, but I guess for me, I think it makes sense to put development in places where it makes sense. You know, places where density help activate the spaces that you're trying to activate. Um, you know, sorry Joe, but like some place like Olive Street and the Simpson property, I personally, I mean it's not my decision, personally I don't think that's a good place for having a large, you know, apartment type development. I think most of that should be in already developed areas and places again where you're trying to activate it. So, you know, it's kind of hard to have the property specific conversation without having that big picture. And I think that's that's one thing. Um, the other thing I think it's a point very well made and, and taken that we have to maintain these properties and, and at least give us time until we are able to figure out what to do. Because I think one of the things that we've seen is that we've taken on a lot of different projects. I, I mean, this is like a drop in the bucket of what all we're trying to do. And I think, um, you know, it, it, but we're also in a unique position because not too many communities have had this type of like acquisition phase, if you will, right? To help chart their own destiny moving forward. I mean, you know, we had to buy the, the, proper, the Valentine property at three and a half million because we didn't have the foresight necessarily in 2010 or 2011 to buy it when it was like 700,000. That's the difference between buying the Valentine property at three and a half million and buying something like the Niccolo property, 35 acres, 36 acres at 925,000 to make it as part of the town forest. So I think we're doing a better job of that. But um, I hope we can all look at this as really kind of a unique opportunity in Ashland's history, and I think a lot of any community in Metro West, um, as we kind of move forward to have these discussions. Allison? Yeah, I just wanted to say, so some of this land was donated, and that's great, but we did spend a lot of money on some of it, and so I think we really need to look at not just being cost neutral, but revenue generating to try to help the community feel like that was an investment in our community and that we're not just adding cost on and on and on. Like I think these things were great things to do, but what we do with them is going to kind of be the legacy mm -hmm. of how people look back at them and if they're willing to do them again. So I think we really, like the Valentine, I kind of balked a little when you said subsidizing someone to be there. Like we're talking about it's prime real estate, it's right on 135, it's a high traffic area. Like I wouldn't want to see someone go in there and operate a restaurant at no rent. Because, yeah, we could right. have a sure. selection process to do that, but why would you pay no rent? That shouldn't be the business model. Like, the business model should be that the town gets something out of that because we spent $3.5 million there. So, you know, I, I, I kind of want to just yeah. keep that fiscal part of it in mind because we do have a lot of expenditures and we have more on the horizon. Yeah, and I, I again, I think, um, I don't think anybody would turn down money for doing any of these things. It's all market forces. We have a lot of things that we want developers to do or businesses to do or businesses to come in, but it doesn't make sense for them to make that investment. Um, and I think it would be great if we could find a restaurant owner who is willing to pay X amount of dollars a month to operate a restaurant, but they might not be there. And at 
they, there might not be a restaurateur that is willing to do that. I mean, would you be willing to do that? You know, ma you know make that investment? Well, maybe at some cost, right? Yeah. Maybe yeah. Zero, but maybe at something slightly below market. But we have people who are going downtown to put in a restaurant. Right? We have the Emerald Green Club. We have restaurants. Like, it, it shouldn't be a zero cost sure. situation where, oh, they're taking care of the building. In my, in my mind, that's not I agree. If, wouldn't, wouldn't argue, wouldn't argue with that. Um, so I, I would turn it over to, I mean, to the board. Does it, first of all, I want to thank you all for being patient with sure. us. This is the first time we've ever had something like this, so it's felt a little clunky and um, a little awkward sometimes, but I hope you found it very helpful to at least have a conversation, start generating some ideas and thinking about it collectively. Um, yeah. The board, um, want to make any comments? I just want to thank everybody. Uh, this was an informal study, and I, and I think we get more done informally than you do when um, you, you, you're forced to be, uh, did I say forced? When you're asked to be here, uh, you came on your own, so that's greatly appreciated. And uh, a lot of the comments and a lot of the suggestions and ideas that I have, that I wrote down, yeah, I think we didn't, have, we didn't have half of those. So that's, that's very helpful. It's very helpful for all of us that, that sit on the board and uh, try to make Ashland a better community uh, for the future. Uh, most of us, uh, our future is, is here. Um, but for, for, for a lot of you, uh, your future is ahead of you. So we want to make sure that it's done and it's done right. So, because that'll be our legacy. I don't want you guys to begin stuck with the generation that left us in debt. That's, that's not a good legacy. But a, a legacy that you'd be proud of and proud of the community that you were born and raised in. I know Paul was born and raised here, Colin, myself. So, I mean, we're, our roots are deep into this ground. So, um, you know, we want, to, we want to do well by the town and by the residents. So, thank you. Sorry, I had one more idea. Um, and it, it didn't really come up with any of these spots because I don't know that there are great spots for it. But I just kind of want to get it um, on the table. So, I work with the farmer's market and volunteer there. And we constantly hear from new vendors or vendors wanting to start out that they would love, like, a incubator space or a commercial kitchen space where they could go and um, it's like the, there's one in Shrewsbury at the um, Worcester Food Bank and it's awesome but you know it's a little bit of an investment but I think that would be great because there's really nothing like that in Metro West maybe a few here and there but the one in um, Beth Reynolds and I went out to the one in Shrewsbury and it's awesome they offer like marketing classes for um, small food purveyors that are trying to get started and um, you can rent kitchen space. They have refrigeration, canning, et cetera. So mm -hmm. I think something like that would be huge. Um, yeah. So just a thought. Sure. Yeah, so um, I know for myself, first of all, thank you all for coming. And it's another night out. It's another meeting. But I, it's so important that as a community, we've decided to purchase these pieces of property. And as many of you have already said, if, they just, if nothing happens with them, they just sit there. So that's why we really wanted to have this forum. And for me, it's, it's the beginning of the discussion. And I really think at this point, some of you are more interested in the Valentine Estate. Some of you might be more interested in the Warren District or the Sibson property. So I think the next steps is having a discussion about a property and people who want to be part of that discussion can show up to a meeting for that property. And that, to me, is how we move this forward. Um, and it, it's always interesting, and I'm following some of the comments that are coming through um, from the live feed. Someone said, well, how, you know, how can we trust the town to follow through when they don't require for certain other issues? And we are the town just like all of you are the town. It's our tax dollars, just like it's your tax dollars. It's our vote, just like it's your vote. The only difference is you've asked us or you voted for us to sort of represent you in some of these bigger decisions or in moving things forward. So you can hold us accountable. You can ask us the questions. And if we're not doing it how you want, certainly speak up and be part of the solution and part of how we keep moving these projects forward. Thank you. I just had a comment um, on the process moving forward. I think that um, if we approach this on a project by project basis, 
without looking at the big picture across the town and having some kind of overall plan. We're going to have committees bumping into each other, um, not knowing what the other one is doing, doing things that are in conflict or work against what another committee wants to do with a piece of property. I just think it's essential that we have some kind of master plan here, particularly for the Warren Historic District. But you know, you can eventually break it up into separate committees, like a committee per property, but there has to be some kind of overall plan or it's just all gonna, we're gonna be running around in circles and bumping into each other like pinball. Well, well, and I agree with you, right? In regards to the Warren District, to me, it's not just what do we do with this parcel or that parcel. It's looking at that whole area and what do we want to see there. And yes, you know, the idea of Mystic Seaport, but it wasn't the Mystic Seaport it is now that it was when it first got created. So maybe that's too grand. I, you know, that's fine. But what can we do with those properties? Do we put money into them to make them historic so that we can generate, or maybe it's just something for our own schools where they can go in and use them. But I, I agree, it can't just be one, but sometimes and, it, and it I, helps to have a I also would encourage looking forward, I mean even a bigger picture, because if we get a new public safety building, we'll have the fire station downtown. You know, Johnstone is historic. There's the newly renovated um, duplex mm -hmm. downtown. There's the town hall. I mean, you could have a historic district down okay. there. I mean, there's a lot that even these properties can have an impact on other parts of the town. So a big plan. Which is why we need more people who are willing to step up and be on the historical commission, um, as Rob said at the beginning of the meeting. We, we need a strategic plan, right, Judith? Yeah, that too. <laughs> Carl, did you have any, we were doing closing comments. Did you have any, Carl, did you have any comments you wanted to make? What's that? What did he say? He said he spoke. He spoke okay. Um, yeah, well, so, I, you know, I'll just, I guess I'll close things out here. Thank you all for coming. I think one of the things I'm coming away with and we've talked about is the kind of the challenge of how to organize around this is, you know, whether, you know, in terms of a strategic plan and then how to actualize all these ideas and how to split it up so we're coordinating to get it. So I think, you know, unless I, I imagine we'll put this on the agenda uh, for a follow-up discussion. And I think, you know, it is one of the key things. I, I think we've seen, you know, that we've got like the CPC folks have some distinct ideas and there's ideas for different uh, properties. So I think really the process ongoing and how to organize it, I think, is I think one of the key challenges I see from this. But certainly great energy here tonight and great input. So I want to thank you all for coming out. So thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thanks thank you very much. much.